Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. I'm Eric. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Eric. And uh, I've never done this before here. I've chaired a lot of meetings, but this is a little more intimidating for some reason. Um, well, what it was like for me, um, well, my first of all, my sobriety date is um, March 17th, uh, 2018, St. Patrick's Day. I didn't know it was St. Patrick's Day, um, and I came into the Berkeley Fellowship, and I hadn't drank it all night, but I had walked probably about 13 miles that night because I... Um, was having some problems at home. And uh, I, I pretty much just walked into Berkeley Fellowship, and everyone just opened up, you know, opened their arms up to me and, you know, welcomed me. And I was like, wow, I'm back home again. And the reason I say that is because um, at one time I had 20 years. And I originally got sober in Lake County um, in 1989. And um, some of my drinking involved going to bars getting drunk, staggering home, not making it home, just taking a step, you know, just sitting down and um, taking a rest on a doorstep and then waking up in the morning in a puddle of vomit. And one morning it was um, at a bus stop where I caught the bus every morning to go to work. And there was all these people standing at the bus stop that I waited with every morning. And I wasn't even embarrassed. It was just like, yeah, that's me. And I brushed the puke off of me and I went home. And um, that, was, that wasn't that was uncommon for me to, to drink like that, you know. Um, and I don't remember anything, you know. Um, and it never ended well when I would tell people, watch this, because that usually involved, like, tackling a paper machine or uh, a newspaper machine <laughs> or uh, diving out of a bar window or, you know, tackling a car or whatever it took, you know, <laughs> for some sort of attention and, and just doing something stupid, you know. Um, it, it was fun for a lot of years, but then when it wasn't fun, it wasn't fun. And when I got to um, where it wasn't fun was when I was in Lake County, and that was in 1989, and um, I was in a closet. <laughs> and I had a phone in one hand, and I had a razor blade in the other. And I was at, at a crossroads, and um, I, I, it was September 1st, 1989. It was a holiday weekend, and I remember thinking, wow, AA is closed. And I had the, the hotline number there, and I thought... You know, they're not going to answer. I might as well just do it, just get it over with. But I ended up calling, and about six guys showed up on motorcycles. And they hauled me off to my first meeting <laughs> to Lower Lake, California. And um, I found my sponsor there. You know, he was one of the guys that picked me up. And uh, soon after, he gave me a motorcycle. You know, I think I had worked like five steps. I'd gotten through the fifth step with him. And, um, and then he took me through the rest of the steps. And... It was it was difficult, you know. Um, I was 26 years old at that time, and uh, I, I was about 14 months sober. I met a lady in the program, and I like to say that I was 13th stepped by an OA in an AA meeting. But <laughs> <laughs> she was using she was using the, the OA or the, the AA program for her OA stuff, and um, you know we were married for 28 years. Um, what happened in 2010 is when I finally went out. I stopped going to meetings at about year 16. And I stopped going to meetings, and I stopped um, working the steps, and I stopped calling my sponsor. I became complacent. Actually, what it was was I got a resentment in the rooms. I was like, the hell with all of you. I'm just going to do this on my own. Within four years, I was drunk. And... Um, I did that again, you know, and that's the insanity, because the first time, you know, when I was sitting in that closet with that razor blade and that phone, I forgot to mention that I was bleeding at both ends. Um, I wasn't well. I was drinking a lot of vodka, um, you know, the big bottles of pop-off vodka, the cheap stuff, you know, it always had to be the real cheap stuff. And, uh, you know, and I'd mix it with cranberry sometimes, and sometimes I wouldn't. I would just drink it. And um, that's the insanity of this disease. You know, when I went back out, in 2010, I forgot about all of that. I forgot about how I had um, was bleeding at both ends and how miserable I was. And I weighed like 
90 pounds soaking wet. Um, so when I walked back into the fellowship of Berkeley, I, I talked to a guy. He, he, says, he sat me down. He says, what's your problem, man? What's going on? So I sat there and, uh, 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 you know, and he listened to me. And I was like, wow. And then he told me it was going to be all right. Everything was going to be okay. And I looked at him and I thought, man, you're crazy. You don't know my problems. How could you say that everything's going to be okay? How is everything going to work out? There's no way. And here I am. I picked up my 18-month chip today. Yay. And uh, actually, it was March 17th, so I, I did hit a birthday meeting tonight. And, um, and I see that man on a regular basis. And it's a miracle that I'm, I'm still sober. I hit anywhere from two to four meetings a day. Um, I also do service work. A secretary five meetings, and I'm also a GSR of another fellowship. I have a sponsee. I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor. Um, and I like to say that I have affiliates, too, because like I, I have a lot of people I bounce stuff off of. And I'm an alcoholic of I don't know what kind, but I like to do things the difficult way. <laughs> and that's, you know, they say you, know, you should only have one sponsor because you're going to pick the one that's going to give you the easiest out. Not in my case, because I end up finding the one that's going to give me the hardest time, and that's what I end up with. And that's okay, because it works for me. Um, let's see where I'm at here with time. Uh, the time? Okay. Um, so, you know, today I, I, go to, I go to a lot of meetings, and I see a lot of people from Oakland through Richmond, you know. I call it the Oakland-Richmond Corridor. And the meetings that I attend are amazing, you know, and the people that I meet are even more amazing because my life is so much richer today because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm very grateful, very grateful for this program. It saved my life again. I've got a second chance at a, third, at a first class life. And, you know, I couldn't say that, you know, 18 months ago. I didn't have a hope. I didn't have any hope. I had no faith in anything. Um, my higher power is something I don't understand. Um, they say, find a God of your understanding. Oh, it's a God of God as we understand Him. And I don't understand Him. And the day I probably do understand Him will probably be a bad day. You know? Um, so, I mean, it keeps, it keeps things just generating new stuff in my life. And, and good things keep happening. And the promises are coming true. I went through a divorce in, in my sobriety. You know? Um, I've been through some pretty hard times. I was in an SLE for my first year. Um, my roommate died. In my, I mean, I went home, and he was dead. And I went to sleep, and I woke up, and he was still dead. And I didn't know he was dead, you know? And then I was at work, and I was told he, he had passed away, and I was like, oh, my God. And um, a member of this program, I called, and he's not here tonight. He usually is. And he came, and he sat with me while I finished this job, because it was on a ladder. And that's the thing that happens in this program. People are there for me. And they're there for you, too. You know, um, that's a beautiful thing. Because I can't do this alone. There's no way I can do this alone. Anytime I try to do something alone, I, I fail miserably at it. So asking for help is something that I, I, have, to, I have to ask for. And I have to um, be humble enough to, to do that. Because I can't do everything by myself. Um, and letting go. Just letting go of the, of the control that I, have, that I think I have to have. Um, the day that, you know, that I see in sobriety that means the most to me is today. Um, I've had a great day today. I've stayed sober, and chances are tomorrow I'll get to stay sober again. You know? um, and I'm really grateful for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thank you, everybody, for listening to me. Gigi Alcoholic. Gigi. Thank you for asking me today. Um, uh, it's funny, we have the same day anniversary, March 17th, different year. I'm going to tell you the year up front because if I start getting to like like 8.50, whatever time it is, and I'm still like in the 80s, um, 
know that I don't have much time left, that I'm going to get sober soon. So my um, sobriety date is uh, March 17th, 1985. And um, uh, it's hard to believe that I'm this old. Um, I was young, like some of you, when I came in here. And um, I was a punk. And um, But I didn't, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And if you have, if you're just cu new, coming in and have like a few days or maybe a few months, and you're like, what the fuck am I doing here? Please know that um, we all started with one day. There's not one person sitting here that didn't start with one day, and there isn't one person sitting here that. Um, I mean, I didn't come in here because I was happy, like, whoa, I really want to go to AA. That's, like, the coolest thing ever. I came in here because I did. it was the last house on the fucking block. And um, bets were off that I'd even make it. Um, I, came, I actually came into, uh, I was first introduced to AA when I was, um, well, I had my first intervention when I was 11. Let's put it that way. Um, but it was for gambling. Um, <laughs> I'll start with that addiction. Um, I used to, um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and um, uh, two crazy parents, both alcoholics. My mom was in show business, and my dad um, was one of the hand honchos of one of the toughest precincts in New York City, and yet... He did MC work. He was a comedian, too, so um, crazy. He wasn't laughing at a lot of the stuff I did, though, but he did get me off the hook. Um, so uh, one of the first interventions I ever had was um, I used to throw ping pong games and bet a lot of money when I was, like, 11 years old, and I also threw a spelling bee. <laughs> <laughs> And um, my uncle Jerry G is one of may he rest in peace. Um, is one of the founders of uh, GA, and um, he did time in Sing Sing, and um, that was after he got his Harvard degree for major embezzling. He found the um, literature of AA in Sing Sing and said this can work for gamblers, so. In my first intervention, they called my Uncle Jerry. <laughs> so I was introduced to 12-step pretty early. Um, and I did a lot of other things, gambling. And uh, uh, I did wind up in, an, in another numbers program later in my recovery. Um, uh, a lot of another money program, um, actually. Anyway, um, I really am grateful that I that you asked me today. I, when I was asked to do this today, um, I was doing a major 11th step, thinking I was like this, uh, um, I was meditating on my um, dying cat, um, thinking I was a pet healer, um, and trying to bring in St. Francis, and that's one of my favorite prayers in the program, actually, trying to bring in St. Francis and showing the light and um, doing an 11-step and saying, thy will be done, you know, and still trying to heal. I don't want him to be in pain, but, you know, it kind of sucks. I mean, I've had loss in here, and my furry friend is, um, mm, it's not a good one. Um, he's seen me through a lot. Um, anyway, um, let's go back to what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. Um, so I already told you about my first intervention, and, um, so I grew up with these crazy parents in Brooklyn, and um, um, they didn't believe in babysitters. So they took their kids to bars and nightclubs. And um, I don't know if any, this is a New York thing. It's the Boar Circuit, and it's, um, it's, uh, it used to be really big in the Catskills in New York, and it's where, like, you're in resorts and nightclubs all day, and you're doing activities, and, like, there's all these comics. And um, my parents would just leave it, these two little kids in the nightclub and go, like, do whatever they were doing. And my sister and I would be, like, memorizing lines, drinking Shirley Temples and memorizing jokes from the comics. And um, that was my dream, <laughs> to be a comic in the Boar Spell. But, um, 
didn't materialize. But um, <laughs> anyway, I mean, that was, they were in the fast lane. They took us to nightclubs. We played hat check girl when they were God knows what doing. And so neon lights. And my, as I said, my mom was in show business. My dad did all this joke writing. And he was like, they were fun when they weren't. When they were, and they were not fun. Let's put it that way. My mom was also a raging Al-Anon and a lot of violence in my home. Um, but their dream for their kids was to be, I was an athlete. And so their thing was, and my dad was this great athlete as well and played semi-pro ball. Um, and uh, he was really an amazing man. Um, uh, was to land a full scholarship through sports and then go into show business. Okay, those are two great odds right there. Um, shows you why I'm still doing doing so well at 34 years sober. But um, so um, I um, was drinking nonstop at like I had um, daily at 14 years old, and I was still playing this sport, this competitive sport, um, and was very was an elite athlete in it. And um, believe it or not. And um, I uh, so was going on the route of what they wanted, and um, and I was drinking and drugging at the same time. How I got on the court, don't ask me. But um, you grew up in my family, and it was like you can drink after you work out. And um, so we all worked out really early. <laughs> um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, one time. Um, um, my dad, I, I was drinking a Bloody Mary at night. I was like 16 years old, right? I was drinking a Bloody Mary. My dad comes in from a shift and he says to me, gee, what the hell are you doing drinking a Bloody Mary at like six at night? And I said, I don't know. And he goes, those are for the morning. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> hey, dad, I love that direction. So, um... <laughs> I mean, that's like hell. So, um, uh, like I said, um, it was an odd upbringing, and I also, my parents are from very different religions, and my mom is an immigrant, and um, uh, I grew up with psychic phenomena, too, so, I mean, like, they're crazy. Um, um, and I, drunk, I used to try to do this, telekinesis stuff from from across the room like I would be like trying to move like oh let's see if I can move that picture you know and um, really thought I could you know that's the kind of shit I grew up with oh let me see if I can talk to this plant um, um, it's uh, brought to a lot of psychics too they couldn't heal me but um and I grew up with the Edgar Casey teachings too, if anybody knows what that is. So anyway, um, I was medit I and I was also meditating way before I came here. You know, doing a lot of hallucinogenics and meditating and doing mushrooms. <laughs> and um, so anyway, by the time I did get a full scholarship and um, in this in this sport, and um, when I was there, and this is like no direction. I picked up the phone one day and I had this offer and I was 17 years old and everybody's standing in my kitchen and my parents and they said, can you, and I had never seen this school in, in the armpit of Louisiana and um, I'm a Brooklyn kid, Brooklyn Jew, um, and this is Louisiana in the 70s and um, with still drinking fountains that are separated and they believe Jews have horns and um, and I just want to get the fuck out of Dodge and um, uh, just get out of there you know I'm done with my alcoholic family I just want to move on with my life and they say you have a full rider and I don't ask anybody and said I'm on the next plane and um I had stopped drinking to train for about a month, but I was drinking cough medicine. And um, when I got there, I, before I went, my dad said, you know what that booze, my dad was an alcoholic, but he said to me, you know what that booze does to you, G? It kills you. You can't play with that. You can't. You got to just stop. And I was like, okay, Dad, I will. 
And I really had no intention of drinking. I was white knuckling it and, well, doing cough syrup and assorted drugs. But um, <laughs> I went to this thing with the team. I went out to this bar, and I wasn't drinking. I was eating fruit from sangria. And <laughs> <laughs> my dad used to have pictures of sangria with peaches in it at home, you know, and um thought, oh, this is okay. And so I was off to the races very quickly and hanging out. There's no in between in Monroe, Louisiana. You're either with her hanging out with heroin addicts and people car car theft and dealers or or you're Southern Baptist. But, um, so, um, guess where I wound up. Um, and so within three months, I was on suicidal watch. I was on probation. I was supposed to be, the coach and the team would literally to go on the road, throw me in the van. And, um, I, with booze in my, my, um, my, um, suitcase. And I'd be on the road like that, drinking booze from hotel room to hotel room to hotel room. I don't know how I played. And, and um, I guess when I was there about four months, um, there was a knock on the door because I wasn't at practice. I was wasted. And um, it was like one of those things out of like, I don't know, what was that, like something high at Ridgewood High or something like, you know, like that Sean Penn movie where the smoke is just coming out of everything and that was my dorm room and there's a knock on the door and it's the coach with like ten, ten players and they're coming in to do an intervention on me. You have a full ride, you've been on suicide watch, you... I was on su fucking suicide watch. I was going to jump from a first floor building. Uh, like, come on. <laughs> um, and they, um, they were really worried about it. Well, I would be worried about me too. But so I, they came in. We're going to do an intervention. And um, I, they were all like, we're feeling terrible. You have this full ride. You're going through this, and it's only the fifth month of school, and blah, blah, blah. And, you you know, you're, we got to get to, you You know, you're really paid a lot of money to play. You know, it's a big southern school to play. I got everything free. I got everything free. And um, I said to them, fuck you. You're ruining my creativity. <laughs> and I wrote a bad check which is what I love to do and went to see a crazy cousin in New Mexico nobody could find me and um oh yeah I thought I was pregnant at the time too and um with my heroin addict boyfriend who was stealing cars um so I took off went to New Mexico my dad found me NYPD <laughs> Um, and they called me home, and I got off the plane, wasted with a southern accent. <laughs> and um, my dad, the second day, is like, okay, we're going for a walk. Your coach called me. It was 1976, and my... So remember, I got sober in 85. It's not too much longer. And um, so... My dad, the alcoholic, goes walking with me, walking with me. We're walking around, I don't know, a mall. I don't know. And he says to me, your coach called and says you need Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you go, I'll go with you. And I looked at my dad and I said, no, dad, I can do this by myself. And he looked at me and said, good. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got on the plane to go back to Louisiana, I told my dad, the NYPD head honcho of Fort Apache in Bedford Stuyvesant, I said to him, Dad, I'm not going to drink. I'm just going to do drugs. <laughs> And my father looks at me and says, just don't get caught. <laughs> um, 
to make a long story short, I got involved in, um, I went from relationship, abusive relationship to abusive relationship when I was in Louisiana. It was ugly. I also had dead, death threats because I had a big mouth and because we were big, um, I, I want to say division, I can't remember it, but we were nationally ranked team. And so I was interviewed for papers. Oh, I want to say this, this I forgot. I, this is not, I always forget this part of my story and I just remembered I can't because I have a lot of time. Um, <laughs> I were big, we had, they had just built this stadium and I was playing this match and I was, I had been drinking and using for days. It was like 85 degrees out, muggy as shit in Louisiana. Flies everywhere, you know? And, I'm wearing sweatpants <laughs> and a sweatshirt and it's 85 degrees and the fucking thing is televised. My match is televised and all you can see are puddles of sweat <laughs> everywhere and it's from the booze, you know, and um, uh, just all over the court, just <laughs> like broadcast news. Um, and anyway, I was offered to come back, but I decided I had had enough of interventions and I decided to go elsewhere. So for years, I went from, um, uh, school to school, scholarship to scholarship, coaches taking care of me. I also was in, um, I did follow in my mom's footsteps and um, people taking care of me in the theater. Um, I went, did lots of geographics, um, moved to, um, my sister and I moved to LA in the early seven, seven, in the late seventies. And, um, my, I did a lot of drugs, obviously, a lot of my story, um, lots of amphetamines and, um, cocaine and, um, when I came, and um, lots of sadness, a lot of violence that I couldn't understand why I was getting into, you know. I didn't consider myself a violent drunk, but I had a mouth and um, fell in love with the wrong people. I was with either men that took care of me or men who beat the shit out of me. That's my story. Um by the time I got back to New York in 1982, I was going, to, I had been throughout on how many schools and scholarships and then offered things that I couldn't show up for anymore. And, um, I wound up at, um, conservatory in New York and something I love so much. And, um, I, you know, I think God gets our attention any way can, you know, like what might work for you don't, won't work for me. You know, we all have our moment of clarity. And for me, I was on my way, I would drool in school. I would drool literally like 10 people in the class and I'd be drooling all over the fucking, and it was a night class, you know, I'd be drooling all over the fucking table. And I remember trying to wake myself up in those classes. And once again, in conservatory, I'm put on probation, you know, and, um, I remember I was trying to make it up and going to the counselors and everything and riding on the subway, trying to read a script. And I am a voracious reader, and I love reading, and I love acting, and I love the theater, and I couldn't read anymore. And I thought, shit, I'm fucked. I'm totally fucked. I don't want to live anymore. Just don't want to fucking live. So I holed up in my apartment and um, just went out to party <laughs> and um, went from bar to bar, man to man, Blackout to blackout, and one of my last drunks in 19... How much time do I have? Uh, I didn't see any besides. Oh, okay. Hey, 20 minutes, get sober. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll get sober now. Um, okay, so one of my, my bottoms was in 1980... I was dry for three years, so I'm getting sober now. Um, so um, one of my last drinks... Um, was, um, I actually, um, was at, um, 
on um, a comedy club with a friend trying to do comedy. And um, apparently people liked us. And um, I don't remember anything about it. And I wound up somewhere on the tip of Long Island being carried up the stairs by someone I didn't know and woke up in a pool of blood. Um, my blood. And I don't know to this day how I got out of there. And um, I had months like that, not months in blood, but months waking up in those places, in odd positions with odd people. And um, I was tired. And I thought, if I remember being carried up there, and the one little thought I had was, I don't care if I fucking die. Who cares? Who fucking cares if this guy kills me, whoever he is? You know? But somehow I got out of there, and I don't know how. And I have so many incidents like that, and God was looking at, after me. So I got dry in 1982 and I because I thought that um, I didn't need you guys because I was busy. And um, I was busy getting my life back. And I was going to get back at everything. And I believed in hard work and everything. And I was going to get it back and fit the pieces together. And um, when a project fell through and I could no longer, I became um, a teaching pro because I couldn't play anymore. And I became, you know, I followed my mom's footsteps and I was doing okay. And and then something went bad. And what would you do when life on life's terms and you don't have a program? So I drank, and I told my boyfriend at the time, I'm going to just go out for five days. No, a week. And he said, okay. And I went out for five days, and I called um, what's in the group, to, at what is um, central office here. And somebody called me back. I was wasted, and they said, this is a, a um, we're going to get a woman to call you back. And um, I said, okay, great. This woman calls me back, and I said, um, I'm drinking now. She, and she said one of the smartest things. She said, don't get in the car. Just sleep it off. Just sleep it off. And, I, and, I, and get to a meeting tomorrow. <clears throat> and I said, okay. And she says to me, you know, you don't write the script anymore. And I was like, how do they know what I do? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> It was, it was like telling an auto dealer, like, you don't do autos anymore. But uh, I was like, everybody's psychic in here. And um, I asked that woman, I said, would you be my sponsor? And she says, let's see if you make it to your first meeting. I met her at my second meeting. I went to four meetings a day. She became my first sponsor. She was a fucking bitch. <laughs> Um, but she took me through the steps, and she said to me, if you have four days and somebody comes in and they have one day, you can get them a cup of coffee. You can empty the ashtrays. You can put the seats away. You can help that person who has three days less than you because you know how to keep sober three days more. And she's a tough cookie, and she did take me through those steps, and I had to get a home group, and I had to show up, and I had to call her every day with fucking gratitude lists. And I had, to, oh, and I had an affair in my first week when I, um, when they said no relationships in the first year. I met somebody my first night of a meeting. <laughs> and I had a boyfriend, but they told me, change the things you're doing. And I hadn't. <laughs> both of them. <laughs> you're the day guy, you're the night guy. He knows AA. He had like two months. He was just like drunk. <laughs> so finally I had like, and that was my third step. Finally I had to let that go. I had to let it go. I was like, this is not sober because they, you know, like, they, like all of a sudden I had this like, oh dear in the headlights. Wait, this might not be normal. Um, this might not be right. Um, I had to learn everything over. I really grew up in this program, I, I have to say. Um, hard to believe that I'm in a, uh, I'll be married 29 years <laughs> this Wednesday um, to another sober member because he was uh, fucked up when he came in. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
my God. <laughs> um, oh, my God. It was, like, really crazy. Um, <clears throat> um, but the funny thing is, I remember hearing him speak first, and I went, oh, my God, I identify with that guy. But um, anyway, so my first couple of weeks, I, I remember, the, I'll tell you how much time. I only have oh. Okay. Twelve. Twelve? Okay. Yeah, thirteen. All right, thank you. Oh, my God. I'm sorry, guys. Um, all right, so um, so um, my first sponsor um, was nothing like me, and I couldn't stand her, and she was a bitch. I was like, you know what? She's a bitch. I met the cool girls and um, in the rooms. We still smoked in those days. And... Um, um, I I would say, she's telling me not to date, man. You know, <laughs> she's telling me not to date. That's because she's uncool. You know, and it was like, she was right. You know, and sick attracted sick. I, rem I remember that. That's why I liked my husband. Um, but uh, anyway, I when I finally had this third step thing, and I remember hitting my knees and saying, I can't do what I've been doing. I just can't. I have to, I can't do this kind of behavior that I you know, I'm doing. And I stopped acting like the, for a little while, like I thought, you know, that sex stuff was a little crazy. And um, when I first saw that, it was in one of the steps in the 12 and 12 when they said, um, romance, sex, masquerading as romance. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> and I was like, okay. I'll change that a little. Um, but then I was suicidal. And um, I was like four months sober, and I was like, I've had it. This is this AA shit. I'm tired of my gratitude lists. I'm tired of, go like, smoking two packs a day. I'm tired of this. I, they're all, I'm done, you know. And I remember sitting at my kitchen table with this big 20-ounce thing of coffee, you know, and um, we didn't have peat, we didn't have specialized coffee, and this was 7-Eleven fucking coffee, <laughs> and it was like gigantic, and I had a ceramic mug, and um, I kept pouring the coffee in there and smoking these cigarettes, and um, I was like, I'm done, I don't know how I'm going to kill myself, but I'm going to do it, fuck AA, and I didn't want to drink though, I wanted to die sober. And so I took that ceramic cup and I threw it across the room into the sink. And it shattered. Surprise. Mm -hmm. And I was standing there with like my cigarette and I was like, pick it up. And I'm like, I know how to do this. I'm going to split my wrists. I'm done. And I had the ceramic there. Remember those, if you're old enough, you'll remember those wall phones. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I uh, have the ceramic cup there, and uh, the wall, the wall phone rings. All right, hello, and I'm killing myself. <laughs> hello. Gigi, it's Charlotte, your sponsor. It's like, hey, Charlotte. And I'm like this, you know. And she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Want to meet me at a meeting? Uh, okay. You know, it's like. So that bitch saved my life. <laughs> Um, uh, that was a really sobriety, and I did go to, and I, I'm, I went to meetings nonstop, nonstop, and things started getting better until I hooked up with my boyfriend before my husband, and he was not ready to stop the violent relationships. He was 13 years sober when he killed himself, and his sponsor and his best friend found him, and, um, on the Jones Beach Causeway, he had put a service revolver in his head, 
And um, I um, have to say that it was the women in AA who saved my life. And the women in AA saved my life. Um, actually, when we first broke up, they did. And I they would walk with me. So you can't go back, you know, you can't go back. You just can't go back to this violence. You can't go back to it. This is before I committed suicide, obviously. And, uh, and um, they would take me to meetings, and they would pray with me over the phone. And they would sit with me. And I did a, um, uh, I've been through the steps so many times, and I've sponsored so many women over the years. And um, one of the things about the, um, the fourth and fifth step is I, I get to identify not only my side of the street, but um, the patterns. And I can choose to, in the sixth and seventh, to have my higher power take them, and then he can make the decision whether he wants to break that pattern or not. But I do have a responsibility to do the next right thing. So one of the patterns my um, one of my sponsors... Um, revealed for me was um, when I was doing this fifth step, because I had a shitload of resentments, and she said, can't you? She said, stop! Don't you see they're all the same kind of resentments? And I said, no. And she said, and this is why sponsors are so great, besides saving your life, she said, you stayed in every fucking situation when you could have gotten out. <laughs> but the bottom line for me is fear I'm not going to get something better. I'm not good enough. Where am I going to go? You know, a lot of times it was a roof over my fucking head when I was struggling. You know, that violence was more acceptable to me than going to a relative's house, going to my family's violence, um, or sleeping on the streets sometimes. So I still made those decisions. And I still made toxic decisions with work. And even in, in like theater circles, I made a lot of shitty decisions because I was afraid. And so I'm going to tell you today where I'm at. Um, um, and fear was always one of those things. You know, face everything and recover or fuck everything and run. And um, I can identify those patterns much sooner. Well, Jesus Christ, I would hope so in 34 years, or what am I doing here? Um, and that's one of the things they told me, too. You're going to say one day when you're sober, you're going to say, oh, my God, I can't believe how great my life is. And then you're going to say, if I knew how hard it was, I wouldn't have stayed. Um, and it's true, because I I haven't had a lot of um, um, prize and cash sobriety. Uh -huh. <laughs> But I've stayed sober, and I've met some beautiful people here. And I think, and the things that used to baffle me, like they say in the the promises, I intuitively know how to handle. I really do. I make better decisions. I'm not in violent relationships. I'm in a happy marriage for 29 years. If that, I really, if that isn't sobriety, I don't know what is. We pray and meditate, and we actually will have a meeting if we can't get together, and we raise hands. <laughs> yes, Larry, would you like to share now? I'll put on the timer. Um, <laughs> and Larry used to usually says, I don't feel like sharing today. <laughs> Can we just read something? Um, um, so I've had loss in here. My dad died a few years ago. I've been homeless in sobriety. Not a fun thing. I've been in horrible legal battles. But I've also had a lot, a lot of wins and a lot of, um, I don't want to say growth because the newcomers might leave. But, um, um, all right, so this is what happened. Am I almost done? Oh, good. All right, so this is, so, um, this is what happened, like, a few months ago, right? So, um, I see this ad, um, looks like, pretty, it looks like what I do. So I answer it, and it turns out to do, be, um, uh, like something beyond my wildest dreams. Like I'm learning all these new things that I've never done before. Like I've never done X, Y, and Z. And it's like, oh, I'm changing hats. This is really fun. It's awesome. 
and it keeps getting better. And then, and all of a sudden, I see red flags. The guy I'm working for is a complete saboteur. And I see him going to shoot himself in the foot. The old me would have said, I'm here to save the day. And, um, <laughs> or, like, okay, I can make this better. I, oh, oh, there's nothing else for me because I'm a piece of shit. You know, there's nothing else. If I leave, it's just like, oh, more of the same, and I'm not going to know. So um, I told him, I said, you, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're fucking up, man. You're, you're really going to fuck up. You're so close. You're so close. You're so close. You're going to make it, blah, blah, blah. Boom, shoots himself in the foot. And I was like, I have to leave this situation. I'm sorry. And it killed me because I love this guy. That's even harder when you love somebody and you see them fucking up. Plus, he was, I'm not into, uh, microdosing, microdosing, <laughs> microdosing and doing acid. I don't know. But <laughs> I kind of, <laughs> it's very creative. But <laughs> <laughs> and the sad thing is, it reminded me so much of my husband. But anyway, so um, I love this guy, you know, but I had to leave. I had to leave. And it was not fun. And I'm like, okay, I'm doing this because I deserve better. And how cool is that? Within the next week, things started turning around better, better, better. And actually, I was on BART to go somewhere one night. And I see I'm up on the platform and there was equipment breakdown. And I run into somebody that's like, does what I do. And then I go downstairs, and I run into somebody else in the program who does what I do. And I'm like, ah! Oh! And we ran it, we, like, took the bus into the city, like, bus to the train to the bus, right? And, um, <laughs> and it was like, oh, this is higher power. This is higher power telling me, you're on the right road. You did the right thing. It's that trust factor. So if you're going, no, never happened for me, I'm going to tell you, no, it's not going to happen for you. Because you're saying it's not. Try to say yes. Yes. I'm, I'm not a motivational speaker. I don't mean that. Okay. <laughs> Try to say yes. yes. Can everybody say yes, I can? <laughs> <laughs> yes, AA, boo. Um, I love AA. I can't believe this. I'm telling a couple of, a, a friend of mine went out after 30 years. And um, I could see her disease doing push-ups. I have never stopped going to meetings. I have never stopped working the steps. I have never. I'm here tonight. I have a fucking cat peeing all over, like, and, um, um, oh, he's peeing on the right pad. He's so smart. Um, he's so fucking smart. Um, uh, but I'm here because it's where God, I believe my higher power wanted me here just to save my own ass tonight. So if I didn't say anything that resonated with you, please know that um, you can go to another meeting and might hear what you need or grab somebody afterwards. Cause, and what was told to me was, if your ass is falling off, put it in a fucking paper bag and drag it to a meeting. <laughs> if this punk could do it, and my husband could do it. <laughs> he seems very quiet, but he's like out of his fucking mind. <laughs> but, um, if I can do it, you can do it. Don't say you can't, and don't say you're more busy to do something here. Um, so, um, don't give up two minutes before the miracle. Time! <laughs>Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.